see them. Mm -hmm. Some of you don't know, so most of you do, I think, but some of you don't know that I had a knee operation about seven weeks ago, knee replacement. And so I'd like a rabbi, I'm sitting here instead of standing, uh, because I'm not sure how long I can stand on this knee without falling over. And you can see I'm a little tippy uh, today. Our stories today are, are amazing. We have the, the second creation story in Genesis. The first one, where God created the heavens and earth and the waters and then the blood, you know, all the things that are listed. And then man and woman is sort of a last resort or is a, something, something extra at the end. In this story, we have man and woman being created and then everything else around them. In the garden, the tree, the fruit, everything. And it's about them and their challenge, their challenge to live in this garden and tend it, to take care of it. There's nothing in this about sin. The whole doctrine of original sin comes from this particular text, but there's nothing in it. There's no Lent in any, you can't look that up in the Bible dictionary. That didn't come into quite a bit later uh, after the church's initial excitement about the Jesus resurrection and how they went out and changed the world with this filled with God and filled with Christ and with power of the Holy Spirit. But when Jesus didn't come back like he said he would, he didn't come back as they thought he would. They're, they began to mellow out a little bit. Their excitement sort of dimmed. They didn't have to have what we have, the Lenten discipline, where they didn't have the discipline at, that they needed to be exciting evangelists and missionaries. And they decided they would make the pews more comfortable than what you're sitting in right now. Uh, and they decided that uh, they could do, they could make their beds more comfortable, or they could eat more and drink more things. They could, they could be comfortable and still believe in God, still preach Christ's message. But they had lost some of the excitement and fervor about, uh, by do, about that, in doing, in get, becoming more relaxed. One of the books I read before I decided to go into the ministry was Harvey Koch's book called The, the Comfortable Pew. And he talked about how the church has gotten into a comfortable position in society and in, in ecclesiastical uh, ways that they were no longer making a big impression on the world as the early, early converts uh, and, and witnesses to the resurrection did. The comfortable pew. There was another book there that was important to me while I was in the ministry, and maybe this was Harvey Cox, was, uh, I think it was Pierre Burton that wrote The Comfortable Few, Canadian. Uh, but uh, the other one was The Secular City that Harvey Cox talked about. It, that Christ was entombed in steel and, con and concrete, and that's where your mission was. So when I came out of seminary, I, I came back from England and I had several churches lined up to, to talk to. There was a, a director of vocations and he saw that we got placed somewhere in, in one church or another. And so uh, 49 years ago this next week, <coughs> I was ordained a deacon in the Episcopal Church where you have a year or so as a deacon before you're ordained a priest. It's like getting your bachelor's degree after going to college, but you know, it really becomes a master's degree uh, after a while. So I, I was ordained and I had a chance to pick one of these three churches. One of them was the Country Club Church in, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the Bay Area. A big, huge church, huge staff, uh, and I would be the number two person in this church. The rector, of course, never wore clericals. He wore a business suit all the time. And he was a, um, a glad hand, go-getter, and tough as nails kind of minister. And I knew the, the fellow that, that was in the position 
that I was going to take, and he was moving on to another church. And uh, I had, and I talked to him. I said, I don't think I could work with you to the to the minister, the, 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 the chief pastor there. He says, I'm glad you found that out now. <laughs> Before you take the job, <laughs> we had we were fighting all the time. The next church was right downtown in the middle of San Jose, the old, old church, which is now the cathedral in San Jose. Old Redwood Church it had a big beam ceiling made by shipwrights with all the kind of knees and things holding it up. Um, huge, big organ. Uh, and it was right downtown, right in the middle of downtown, which was pretty sleazy at that time. It was just a little bit run down around it. Uh, around the area. There were lots of homeless people. There were lots of addicts and drunks in the park right across the street. And, uh, and it seemed like a wonderful place to do, a, to do a service. And I would put on my car and I would go out on Friday nights and Saturday nights and walk the streets uh, to see if there was anything I could do. And I did have some people that came and wanted some help, needed some things. And, made some, some great friends. But one woman came up to me, I'm sure she was probably uh, a woman of the night, and she said, why are you wearing that collar? I said, well, it keeps me from, it keeps me safe from women like you. She said, it won't keep you safe. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like, like Satan in our story, you know, coming up to Jesus and saying, uh, or, or coming up in the garden and saying, no, you won't die if you eat that, free, that fruit. You'll be like gods and goddesses. You'll be like God. You'll know the knowledge of good and evil. And so they try it. And they find their eyes are open and they notice, as Shirley read, that they found each other naked. Is that the knowledge of good and evil? There's nothing wrong with being naked. But there is law, something wrong with going against God's rule. You are here to tend this garden. That's, that's what we gar the garden is for. It's for you. You can do anything in this garden except eat that tree in the middle, eat that fruit. Everything else is yours. The story is not about original sin. The story is about vocation. This is what you're called to do, to tend this garden. They were called to tend their garden. We, too, are called to tend our garden, the world we live in, our water, our forests, our sky our earth. Are we doing that? Or have we made ourselves like God? And uh, we'll, we'll let the Mexicans do the gardening as long as they can come in this country for a while and go out. We are polluting. We don't need any regulations. You know, it's, it's all about business now. And it goes on and on like that. Our call is to tend the garden as well as Adam and Eve's call. So they get kicked out of the garden. And, but they didn't die. They didn't die because they were really sorry that they did what they were not supposed to do. They were really sorry that they ate this fruit, that they disobeyed God. And now they had to go east of Eden and toil in the really dirt, the real dirt, not the garden, not the loam. Not the garden that we have where we keep amending the soils and they grow all kinds of wonderful things, or at least our garden, our gardener. Uh, and they had to go and toil and earn and work for their bread and their food and everything else. So that story is about vocation. When we get to the gospel story, Jesus has just come from being baptized. He grew up. Probably like any young Jewish boy, he went to the synagogues, he studied the Torah with the, with the rabbi and, uh, and with the other children. He learned to a, a trade, probably, with, from his father, Joseph. And uh, he was ready to go in now. He was getting to be a, a, a teenager in his, or maybe even later than that now, into his uh, or late 20s, early 30s, to become a carpenter or whatever trade it was. 
and instead he went out and got baptized by John the Baptist. And this is a radical thing. It wasn't like we always have a pond here and everybody gets baptized. It was, it was something new. It was something that was not done. But people were doing it because John the Baptist was saying, you know, the ax is at the tree, the, fi the fire is coming. Do this. Wash yourself of your sins. Wash yourself away. Become children of God. Become clean. Come clean with what you're, com what you're supposed to be what you're supposed to do. And they love to hear that message because there were so many rules that the Pharisees kept piling on them that most of the people were ritually unclean. They couldn't go to the temple. They couldn't do a whole lot of things. Uh, and uh, they, wanted, they wanted some more. They wanted some recognition. They wanted some recognition from, uh, about God and recognition from God. And Jesus came and he was baptized. And then, right after that, he went into this wilderness. And the wilderness is probably, there it's probably uh, 35 miles long and 15 miles wide. There, just between where he was baptized and the Dead Sea. It's all wilderness, it really is. It's just these washes and rocks are crumbling and dirt and, and, uh, and mud when it really rained, it would flood and it, like, it's kind of like the deserts out in Arizona uh, where you walk through and there's only scrubble or cactus and, and not much else. And he went out there and for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted. Now, have you ever tried fasting? Some, some of you probably have, but not for 40 days, not even for four days or so would be a long time, I think, for most of us. And when he was finished with that, he was, he was famished, he was hungry, of course. And that's when the devil comes. Satan comes to him and says, look at all these rocks. They're all about the size of the, the loaves of bread that your mother made for you. If you're really hungry, if you're really the son of God, you can turn these rocks into stone. And if you could do that, the implication was, you could feed an army. You could, you could hold out against the Romans. You could make this the promised land that it's supposed to be. If you're really hungry, you could make these rocks turn to bread. Well, I tried making bread once and it turned into rocks. So really, <laughs> but, uh, but, but he quotes, Jesus quotes Satan and he says, you, you should, man should not live on, by bread alone, but by the very word of God. So the devil picks up on that. Oh, you're going to quote scripture. Well, I'll quote some scripture too, you know. Let's go up on the top of the temple, the high peak of the top of the pillar of the temple. And if you jump off, you won't hurt yourself because God said his angels will come and keep you from stubbing your toe on the stone. You could do it, and it'd be a big spectacle because it would. You know, people like miracles. They like the, the show business. They like some excitement. And if you jumped off the top of here, you would have a big following. You'd be popular. You'd be the number one man. Everybody would come to see you. And Jesus quotes back to scripture, you know, and says, uh, not to tempt God, not to test God, not to see whether God really would do that. Bring his angels to keep you from falling. So Satan then now takes him to the top of a very high mountain, which is sort of symbolic of Mount Sinai, where Moses got the law. Up on the top of this mountain where you could see symbolically all of the nations of the world and their splendor. And he says, they've been given to me, Satan says, they've been given to me, and I'll give them to you if you will fall down and worship me. Doesn't that sound like a tempting thing to be if you have power, if you have charisma, if you can feed everybody in yourself, and then to have all of that, wouldn't you make a wonderful emperor of the world? And Jesus said, no way, no. That's not, that's not what I want. I want to worship only God, not you. 
what does that have to say about us and for us? You know, if we're talking about the wilderness, the empty place in our lives, in our hearts, the emptiness around us in our in our world, in our country, and not just the deserts, but the emptiness in relationships. You know, how many people know more than the neighbors right next door to you? Do you know somebody? Do you know everybody on the block? Do you, you, do you go to a, a meeting and do you get want to know the people that are there? Or do you go and meet with your friends and you know talk and have a great time with each other, with your neighbors across the street? What happens to you when you close up and become more and more insular like that? That's like the desert. Those are the desert places. That's where you need, that's where you need to have this relationship with God, this relationship with Christ, who will fill your need and will help you push you out into relationship with others. Once you realize your own need, then you can see the need in others. And once you realize how hungry you are, you can understand the people who don't have anything to eat. Once you have your pockets jingle, you can realize that there's people that don't have anything and you want to give them something. Give always. The, the Pope recently said that uh, in his Lenten message that, you know, what you can do is give alms to everyone. How much? Everyone, everything. Jesus said that all the time too. Give all that you've got. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. But now, if we follow Jesus, if we follow that idea, we will be gracious and, and give not everything that you have. You know, we're always talking in parabola, but give something. Give not only money or food or clothes, but give some of yourself. Make connection person to person with that, that stranger, that, that person who has just come to this country, or that person who is scared to death of not being able to stay in this country. Give them some encouragement. Give them some of yourself. Give them some agape. Give them some love. That's our vocation now to tend this garden and all of us growing in it, all of the growing things, not just the plants or the, or the atmosphere or the waters, but each other as well. We're as much a desert, each of us, and have these lonely places within us where if we connect with God, we will be filled. We will be filled with the bread and the wine at the table here. We'll be filled with the waters of baptism will be filled in our world with wonderful, wonderful things, more than the devil can give us. We don't have to jump off the tower, and we don't have